Thank you. Thank you very much, Amrita and Suki, for this opportunity and for your kind introduction. <clears throat> I must say I have a soft corner for Bombay for a couple of reasons. I still remember very well. This was uh, November, December of 2008. And I remember going to Vipassana and Nagatpuri for 10 days. When I came back, came out of the of the 10-day camp, the Bombay blast had happened, right? And I didn't even know about it. But one of the reasons for me to come to Bombay was uh, to go and visit uh, the little restaurant near Fort where Shantaram, the really famous book, had come out. So I remember sitting in Leopold's just after the attacks and having, I met the author there. So I think that was a lovely Bombay moment for me because for me, Bombay is through books like Shantaram and Maximum City. And it was also on that trip that I did my first walking tour in India. This was 2008, 2009. So that's my uh, Bombay connection. Um, clearly, Kaki has uh, taken walks to a different uh, to a different level. Um, before I get started, I would uh, love to uh, know a little bit about the audience. Um, I know you're all on mute, you're asked not to speak, but if you could use chat and if you could just maybe two things, what's your age and which city are you coming from? If you could please share that, because I also see some familiar faces in the audience, uh, lots of new folks. Um, just two things. Thank you, Sneha. First to go, 21 from Delhi. Okay, hey, Baba, from Bangalore. Lovely. I'm curious, okay, Mumbai again. Thank you, Manisha, Mumbai, um, Noida, okay, lovely. So we've got North, we've got uh, South, we've got Bombay covered, more Bangalore, more Bombay, more Delhi. Anybody from the East of India? Okay, thank you. More Pune, Bombay, Mumbai, Delhi. Okay, we really covered the North, covered the South, covered the West. All right, okay, Bangalore again. Okay, looks like it's it's split between uh, Delhi, uh, Mumbai, and uh, Bangalore. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, folks. I, I get a sense of where you're all coming from, pretty much across the country. All right. So with that, let me take you into the city that I come from, right? Bangalore. Can you all see my screen? Yeah. All right. So this is what I call the Bangalore story. This is four cities in a city. I'm sure Bangalore is more, but... I'm talking about the four distinctive cities um, in Bangalore, right? Um, having known different parts of the country that you come from, um, I have a question. If I say Bangalore to you all, what comes to your mind? Right? One word that comes to your mind, if I say Bangalore, I would love to hear. If you could please use chat, right? Lal Bag, thanks, Vibha. Uh, green, IT, sure, gardens. I am sure IT again. Okay, lovely trees. Thank you. Air Condition City. Thank you very much. iPhone. I don't know your name. Blue Sky, IT. Okay, traffic. Finally, we hit that button. Huge traffic. Church Street and Lakes. Uh, traffic again. Sure. Lakes. Okay. We're not really here about Lake much. Thank you, Commander. That's Pubs and Brigade Road. Yes. We are the original pub city of the country. So I'm, I'm catching pubs, lakes, koshis. Thanks, Anisha. A bit of a colonial feel there. Um, and I'm also catching a lot of IT, right? Okay. Thank you. Matt, of course, the new uh, <laughs> mango shops in Meki. That's very, very uh, precise, Pabitra. You're right. Um, and for all of you, yes, Bangalore is a mix of these emotions, right? It's a mix of gardens, parks, tech, um, of course, traffic, because a lot of people coming into the city. But there are also nuances that I'm catching Koshi's, I'm catching a map today. So this is what we look at in today's talk, right? Sorry, yeah. We look at how Bangalore came to be, how it's evolved. And we also look at what is the Bangalore culture, the mindset. Um, I'll probably use the next, about 40 minutes. If you have any questions, do come in on chat. Uh, we'll also open up for Q&A, right? Um, I also have a confession to make. I'm not a historian. I do see very uh, uh, prominent faces in the uh, audience. So um, if you have corrections, feel free to come in. I'm a storyteller and I enjoy telling stories of the city, right? All right. So with that disclaimer, if you really look at the origin of the city, 
the story goes that the king was uh, uh, out on a hunting spree, lost his way, was really hungry, met an old lady. She cooked him a pot of baked beans. He was so happy and hence he called it Benda Kaluru or Bengaluru. But this is really mythology, right? This is just one of the claims of the names of the city. There are several other. It's called, uh, it was called Benga, Bengavaluru is what they say, the city of bodyguards. Some people say it was named after Bengal the tree. Like most cities, there are several claims to the origin. And because it's mythology, you could really you know, go with your favorite. And this is my favorite, the city of baked beans, right? Um, but actually, Avre Kalu, that's, that's the local beans, really, not these kind of beans. That's the origin of the word Bangalore, right? But if you really look at uh, the founder of the city, it's Kempegada the second, right? It's this person in the 1500s who really is considered the father of the city. And what he sets up is what I call city one, right? That's really ground zero. And what do I mean by ground zero? This is what he's got, right? What you see at the bottom here is where the palace was. And what you see around is uh, the marketplace. So the local language is called the Pete and the Kote. Pete being the market, Kote being the fort and where his palace was. And this is the earliest formations of Bangalore, right? Um, this is what we fondly call Chikpet today, or Chikpete, Chikka Pete. Pete means a market, right? Chikka is small. So this is how Bangalore really came to be, right? Um, the fort still exists very much, and there's a small palace as well. And of course, it's changed um, many royal families, and I'll come to it a little later. But if you're wondering, how does Ground Zero look like? Um, this is this is Pete. It's really broken, broken down into a lot of smaller Pete's, right? You have Aki Pete, Bale Pete, Sultan Pete. So what do all these Pete's really mean? There are more than 20 or different Pete's. It really goes back uh, to a time in Bangalore where it was based on your uh, caste divisions, which reflected in your trade. Like, for example, Aki Pete, that's where people sold rice. Bale Pete is where they sold bangles, right? So think of it as a supermarket or sorts. And that's where the oldest part of Bangalore was. It was it was a market area, very much, a Pete, right? Um, this is the total <laughs> You get a sense of how Pete is. Narrow roads, clearly not meant for walking. Sorry, not meant for traffic. You did not meant for walking. Not the period. It's not often the popular. Okay. You see the famous PR market. Um, the flower auction really started at 2 30 in the morning there, right? And it's over by 5 30. So you really have to get fresh flowers. Um, it's really that early. So this is really the heart of Bangalore, right? This is what I call Chick Pete. But if you go to Chick Pete today, what would you get to see, right? You really get to see a lot of trade in Bangalore, a lot of craftsmen, right? These are the goldsmiths there at work, right? For, for, busy making all the gold ornaments that are being sold. This is really the backbone, right? Before your Tanish, so the word came about, a lot of the uh, gold ornaments that you would see is all made by artisans in the old city. And just like whether it's Delhi or Jaipur, every city has the oldest part of town. This is the oldest part of town for Bangalore. So you're seeing a lot of craftsmen here. Apart from what gold, what else do you see here in uh, big prominence is um, take a look at the next video. It could be a little noisy, um, but observe cleanly, and you I'll, and I'll share what I need to. There you go. Sorry about the noise, right? But what's happening there is really the manufacturing of a sari. These are um, looms, these are uh, machine looms. 
what we had was hand looms back in the day, but these are all par looms, and that's how sarees are made. So if you go to the oldest part of Bangalore, you'll still see thousands of such looms, right, where the sarees are being made. Um, if you look closer, right, if you look closer, my interest also is not just how the sarees are being made, but just look at how these sarees are being made, right? Um, these are beautiful silk sarees, of course, whether it's an Indian woman or um, an international uh, visitor. Look very, very elegant in our sarees, but take a closer look at what you see next, right? Um, the sarees are being made, right? And if you see these little carts and these little holes, right? And uh, as the sari is being woven, these little cards are changing, right? And you'd see the whole mesh of the threads and you know, the whole work. So you're wondering what's happening here. This is what's happening here. This is what is called a jacquard's loom, right? This is a French engineer in the 1800s, set up the jacquard's loom. Why is the jacquard's loom special? Well, if you change the card formations, the design of your sari changes, right? And uh, there was the first time there was a machine where you changed the configuration, the output changed, right? But why do I talk about this machine in the context of Bangalore, right? So this machine also really gave rise to something that we use day in and day out today. If you're wondering what is that machine, that's the modern day computer or even our smartphone because Charles Babbage, the part of the modern, of modern day computing was inspired by very much these punching cards, the zeros and ones. And um, today, Bangalore is known as the IT city, but I'm guessing um, the use of technology, especially in weaving, was, was here centuries ago, right? Um, so there you are in the old city. You're looking at a lot of these artisans, right? Either making saris or gold. But we have another connection here in the old city, right? Um, Kaki is from Bombay. We have a Maratha connection as well. This is Chhatrapati Shivaji. His father, Shaji, um, was stationed in Bangalore. This was in the 1600s. He was a general for the Mujapur kings. Um, and he happened to live in the oldest part of the city. So which means Bangalore also has a Maratha influence, right? When I say Maratha influence, of course, uh, um, Shivaji spent a few years of his uh, childhood here in Bangalore. Um, also, you'd see a lot of reference to Shivaji in Bangalore. And what do I mean by it, right? Um, you have a Shivaji theater in Bangalore on JC Road, very much a statue of Shivaji. You have a Shivaji military hotel. You have Shivaji Nagar. There's a lot of uh, um, a lot of reference to the Marathas here. I remember going to school in Bangalore in the 80s and 90s, and my classmates, a few of them, were Marathi speaking, and they didn't come from Bombay, but their families have been in Bangalore for centuries, right? So um, that's the Maratha connection here in Bangalore. But let me also ask you all, right? Um, who is the most uh, famous Maratha coming out of Bangalore? If I had to ask you that question, any of you, if you want to uh, warrant a guess, right? Let's say the most famous Maratha uh, coming out of Bangalore, right? Anybody, any guesses? <laughs> Shivaji Rao Gaikwad, yes, that's right. Thank you very much, Shubha. You've, uh, you've really cracked it right. And you're right, I think it's a little known fact. Rajni Khan is really Shivaji Rao Gaikwad, comes from a, from a Maratha family, grew up in Bangalore. Um, his father was a police constable. He went on to you know, become a bus conductor in Bangalore and then became a superstar. Of course, the world knows him as a Tamil superstar, but he's a Maratha from Bangalore, right? So that's that's our most famous uh, Maratha coming out of Bangalore. Um, my Tamil friends sometimes stand very surprised. Um, he's very often in Bangalore, you know, looking at his roots. And um, most recently, he was in Bangalore and he went to the Jainagar bus depot. That's where he worked in the 60s and 70s, right? So that's our Maratha connection. But taking a step back from the superstar and really looking at history, right? Who you're seeing here is, is Haider and Tipu, the, the Muslim father-son pair who ruled the kingdom of Mysore. So if you see Bangalore, it was very much a part of the Mysore kingdom. 
The Mysore kingdom was ruled by a series of different rulers, right from the Bijapur kings, Saji, the Wadiyars of Mysore. And in the 1700s, it's changed hands, right? It came to the father son duo, Hyder and Tipu. Hyder and Tipu, of course, ruled over Bangalore. And they ruled over Bangalore from their capital in this island called Shirangapatna, right? Um, why do I talk about this idol, island called Shirangapatna in the context of Bangalore? I'll come to it in a bit, right? This is the erstwhile Mysore state in the 1700s, right? There's, a, there's quite a bit happening here um, in the 1700s, right? Not just here, in fact, across the world. There were events that really go on to change the history of this region. What do I mean by this? The story starts in Bengal in the 1700s, in the second half of the 1700s. There's the Great Bengal Famine, and there are millions of people who are dying. But the British East India Company that's ruling large parts of India have a different problem at hand. It's not the famine. It's not the people dying. But they're unable to collect taxes from these people. So what do they do? They go and lobby in the English Parliament and they get a bill passed called the Tea Act. What did the Tea Act do? Until then, all the tea that came from Asia went into the godowns of London the government decided where they wanted to sell the tea. But with the Tea Act being passed, this privilege was handed over to the East India Company. So they could decide where they sold this tea. And where they actually sold this tea was in America. And the Americans didn't like it because they kept increasing taxes on tea. And they said, uh, uh, we will not pay for uh, these tax agents on tea. So in the 1770s, when a group of uh, folks the revolutionaries in Boston get onto the ship and throw some tea off the coast of Boston, very famously called the Boston Tea Party. I'm not sure who had the party though, but it was Indian tea that was being thrown off the coast in Boston, right? It was the first time ever the local Americans were rebelling against the great British um, empire, right? And a few years later, in the Battle of Yorktown, when the American army, led by George Washington, who becomes the first president of America, he defeats the British army, led by this gentleman, Lord Cornwallis. Lord Cornwallis, having lost this war in America, is sent back to England. Any guesses where is his next posting? It's here in India. And he comes to Bangalore. And here, he fights Tipu. And eventually fights him in Sri Rangapatna. And in what is called the Third anglo mysore War, here, Tipu is defeated. Not just defeated, they take away half his kingdom. They ask him to pay a huge sum in royalty, which he falls short. So what you're seeing here is the British take away two of his kids, right? Two of his sons as hostages, thinking that they've cut this uh, king to size and they don't have to worry about him anymore. But Tipu really doesn't give up. He sends his envoys to... France, because your enemy is enemy is your good friend. He's hoping that he's going to get a lot of help from Napoleon. Napoleon is very, very ambitious, wants to come and help Tipu. He's in Egypt, but unfortunately his ships are burned by the British. And because of the French Revolution, he has to go back to uh, France, unable to come to India. Right? But who comes to India, who comes to Bangalore in that period is a young Englishman. In fact, an Irishman called Arthur Wellesley. And it's he who leads the British army under the guidance of uh, a general. And in 1799, Tipu is not just defeated and killed, right? And Arthur Wellesley goes on to become the first commissioner of this region. Who is Arthur Wellesley? Well, he's the same person who defeats Napoleon in the Battle of Waterloo in 1815, very famously called the Duke of Wellington. So I'd like to believe what it took to defeat Napoleon, all the tricks were learned in my backyard here in Bangalore and Mysore, right? So that's how you're seeing how global events have shaped this region. For a moment, think of it, the ifs and buts of history. What if America um, never won, would have never won against the British? They would have been the crown, the, the jewel in the British crown and probably not India. What if the French were successful in coming to India, right? A lot of ifs and buts in history. 
But as history goes, the, the British defeat Tipu. Um, that's the war monument in Shirangapatna. Now, uh, a, a king is installed in Mysore. He's just four years old. And the British take control. And they set up their base in the same island of Shirangapatna, right after the war in 1799. But what do they see there is a big problem. They see a lot of their uh, um, folks in their army are dying. This is a European grave in Shirangapatna, right? And if you wonder why are they dying, now because the war is anyway over, what really comes to the forefront is they're all dying because of malaria. Shirangapatna is a little island infested with mosquitoes. So the joke goes that the mighty British uh, army fell for the tiny mosquito. They had a real problem at hand. Right? And they were not comfortable in this little island. And they wondered, what do we do? So that's when the hunt for a new capital began. And there were four places that were shortlisted. It was uh, Hosur, the border of Karnataka and Madras. It was Sira, and it was Chittadurga. And the fourth option was Bangalore. I'm not sure if they had a real estate agent looking for these places. But eventually it was Bangalore. Bangalore, I'm, I'd like to believe it's the weather, and not the traffic back then. And that's how Bangalore became a British cantonment. So if you look at the map of the city, this is in the 1800s. The fort and the pate, what we saw as city one, right? was the earliest part of the city. With the British coming in here in the 1800s, that's when you're seeing the cantonment being formed, right? Cantonment is extremely British, right? What do I mean by it? This is city two, right? And this is everything when you're, when you're talking about Koshi's and Church Street and the pubs and the churches. So this city two is um, what I call churches and clubs and parks and pubs, right? So Bangalore has no dearth of them. This is St. Mark's Cathedral, one of the oldest churches in the city. Take a closer look, right? This is the Trinity Church. You're seeing the stained glass windows um, at the back there. And as you look closer on the pillars in the walls, do you see these little tablets, right? These little tablets. This is what is called a garrison church. And what do I mean by a garrison church? These are churches built in the cantonment meant for the soldiers in the army, right? Now, as you see these tablets and as you look closer, these tablets are in the memory of soldiers that they lost here in, ba in, in this region, Bangalore and around, right? And this is one of my favorite tablets from that church. And it says, the sacred sacred to the memory of George Staple Dobby Esquire, the Mysore Revenue Survey, who died from the effects of wounds inflicted by a tiger near Shimoga. So I'm wondering how life must have been in the in the uh, 1800s, right? And also if you look at the age, right? Aged about 30. So you're really seeing a lot of young folks who joined the army, who come here <clears throat> to India to fight these wars, if they survived these wars, then uh, they also had malaria to fight. If they survived the malaria, you also had the big um, tigers. Life really was, um, I would say, very, very unpredictable, right? Um, that's why what we saw in India was a lot of these young army officers who survived quite a treacherous journey, survived these wars and all these hardships. So they really stood brave against all these conditions, right? There's one problem. India became a place increasingly for a lot of young, brave British men. And what they didn't have was the company of the British woman. So that's when um, you'd see what I would call is probably one of the largest schemes by a corporation, the British East India Company, to entice women Right, single women in England to come into India and in cantonments like Bombay and Bangalore and Delhi and to look for a husband. Right, because until then, uh, a lot of these English officers were taking local wives, which they didn't approve of, the culture was uh, being affected. So that's when you'd see the influx of the women. Right, 
In fact, until the 1830s, there's a lobby in the English parliament not to allow Christian missionaries and um, uh, not to allow Christian missionaries really into India because what the British loved was to have multiple wives. Finally, the lobby fell. And like I said, with the influx of women, uh, this has been very beautifully documented by uh, a very interesting book by Andy Corsi. It's called The Fishing Fleet. It says, the husband hunting in the Raj. And what do I mean by it? You had the boat loads, ship loads of these single women who came into India looking for a suitable match. Of course, they all went for an attractive, young, good-looking uh, officer with a lot of money. But then, if you didn't find an attractive officer um, with a lot of money, then the next option was an old officer, but still had a lot of money, right? And they had scandalous affairs with these officers, with the younger younger officers, right? Because they were married to the older, older ones. Um, a lot of them who did not find a suitable match uh, had to go back to um, England. And in fact, there was even a word for them. They were, they were called the returned empties, right? Because they went empty-handed. So in, in, you, you, you really find a lot of archival material about how these British memesabs came into India uh, to find a partner and really you know, make a home for themselves, right? So this is one of these archival pictures. So really you're seeing in, in from the 1830s, 40s, the influx of the British uh, women, right, coming into India. But as I talk about the infect, influx of British women coming into uh, India, um, and with young officers, um, one other famous character who made Bangalore his home was Sir Wilson Churchill. Churchill lived here from 1896 to 1900. Right? He spent four years of his uh, life in Bangalore. Churchill, um, right after school, was sent off to Sandhurst for military education, which means he didn't get to go to Oxford or Cambridge, um, something that he held uh, as a regret for his life in terms of lack of education. So he spent a lot of time in Bangalore um, doing two things. One, he was a voracious reader, read a lot to make up for his uh, inability to go to university. And he also had a butterfly collection. These are the two things that kept him busy. Um, he was very much into polo. That's Sir Wilson Churchill. What's his polo team? with his uh, other regimental officers. On one such trip for to play polo in Hyderabad, so Wilson Churchill fell in love with this lady called Miss Parker. Miss Parker was the daughter of the highest ranking British officer in Hyderabad. He was a resident of uh, Hyderabad. And Churchill was a lowly officer. And he had this habit of writing these long letters of love for the lady. And he uh, decided to take the matter more seriously. And he would uh, confess his love. So he would meet the girl's father, the, the resident, and he, he would ask the lady's hand for marriage. And the resident would reject and he would say no. And the reason given was the boy does not have bright prospects. Too bad for Mr. Churchill. Um, he still continued to be in church with, he still continued to be in touch with uh, his lady. His last letter to her was written um, after World War when she had lost, um, I think, two of her sons in battle. And he wrote, to her as the Prime Minister of uh, England. So India was also a land of uh, romance. But Churchill, like we all know, was, was considered the world's most highly functional alcoholic. He would start his day with half a bottle of champagne. Um, and his favorite spot in Bangalore to go get a drink was the Bangalore Club. Um, and there's some bit of Churchill memorabilia here. When Churchill left Bangalore and left India, he left with an unsettled bill of rupees 13. So if you go to Bangalore Club even today, you will find the register wide open. If you look closer, it says uh, Lieutenant WLS Churchill, rupees 13, um, is what he owes to the club. In the 90s, when Prince Charles was, was visiting India, when he was at the Bangalore Club, and when he saw this widely being displayed, um, clearly Churchill being the most famous Briton, considered a statesman there, and was quite embarrassed. He decided to... Uh, Pay off the debt, which I think in today's terms is about, you know, about 70, 80,000. But Bangalore Club refused to take the money. I think this uh, does more uh, good for them than having settled the debt. 
very often churchill is referred to by uh, british historians as uh, the greatest britain or uh, um, a statesman but i think his his uh, conduct in india was far from it far far from it right um but not everybody was uh, i would say as conniving as churchill we also had some interesting officers this is mark cabin mark cabin uh, being one of the commissioners of bangalore came to india as a uh, as a as a as a teenager right most of us know of mark cabin through cabin park cabin park is this sprawling park in the heart of bangalore um and he really grew up to the rank of being a commissioner a few years ago i had a british couple and their request was we're going to spend two days in bangalore and all you want to do is you know just look at mark cabin's remnants and that was a fairly odd request we looked at uh, cabin road look at cabin park we looked at cabin pet um a series of different um, places in bangalore because he was quite a popular officer uh, did a lot for the infrastructure of bangalore reduced corruption in the administration and all of that so the statue that you see is erected by public subscription twice he resigned as the commissioner but both the times the, the public wanted him to come back so he would come back very very popular man um, also the governor's residence even today uh, in bangalore the raj bhavan is mark cabin's residence built in the 1830s so to, i had to apologize to the couple saying that the one phase act to take you in is uh, raj bhavan because it's the governor's residence but as luck would have it we happened to meet the adc outside and he invited us into the raj bhavan it's a beautiful 16 acre acre campus and uh, we got a lovely tour of um, mr cabin's residence so that's that's the couple um she also happened to be the minister of treasury at the isle of man so i asked her why is it that uh, you were so keen on mark cabin and that's when she told me that mark cabin comes from a little island called the isle of man in england and he came to india in his late teens and he never went back and he never got married he went back early in his 60s after he finished his service and he died on his way to england near the suez canal and uh, when his body was brought to england and people realized that he had willed his entire wealth to build cottages for the poor and even today in the isle of man you will find these cottages called the mysore cottages and this lady had seen these cottages as a little girl growing up and she wanted to come and you know uh, um explore mark cabin's uh, place of work so this quite an interesting to us so much that we learn from uh, guests who come in here and she carries a very interesting book called from man to my sock so this is the isle of man to my sock that was mark cabin there's one other colonial connection that we uh, that bangalore houses is a lot of military presence here that's the madras sappers one of the oldest regiments of india uh 1780s they fought was across the world Take a look at this uh, little video. Uh, this is from the movie Saving Private Ryan. Tom Hanks, an Oscar-nominated movie. Um, watch closely at one of the weapons he's using, and I'll talk about it in a bit. <laughs> So look closely this is what i was referring to what tom hanks is asking for is give me the bangalore and what does he mean by that is give me the bangalore torpedo bangalore torpedo is a weapon developed in madras sappers in the 1900s and this was used in the trench warfare of world war 1 which really changed the course of the war and uh, that invention was in bangalore this is also a testament to the scientific temper in the city not just in warfare but also in medical sciences this is ronald ross the doctor again stationed in the madras sappers he was a major general until then people thought malaria came from bad air mal is bad and area is air so it was he through his seminal work here in bangalore figured out that it is not bad air but to the mosquito he got hold of a um, local for hussein khan put him in a mosquito tent paid him 8 annas for every mosquito bite hussein khan was very happy because the rest of the world is not getting paid for mosquito bites and here was a man paying him and that's how he discovered that it was a female anopheles mosquito who was responsible for uh, um, malaria and he ended up finding the vaccine talking about bangalore in the 1900s when you have a lot of these british men 
these are the kind of colonial houses that were probably lived in, very, very distinctive in architecture. A lot of this is captured by um, one of Bangalore's most, most famous uh, most famous cartoonists, um, Paul Fernandez. Um, a lot of his work depicts colonial Bangalore, including cafes like this. This is Toshi's, very much still a popular coffee house. The 1940s um, have served the Queen of England, the Minister of India, the Nehru, very much with the old world trust. Right? So you get a, the colonial feel of the city. Again, all of it um, showcased by um, Paul Fernandez's uh, works. Bangalore is also known as a pop city. I heard one of you mention this pop city. Here is where you had the, the British uh, regiments, British cantonment station. Very often they would go to the older part of town to have the local alcohol. Became very problematic. And that's when you had distilleries here. So that they could make um, beer for the sturdy Tommies. And clearly home to these uh, distilleries in Bangalore. Um, in fact, the most famous beer brand um, from the country comes out of Bangalore. So that's Kingfisher. Um, so all this is what I call City 2, Contonan Bangalore, very much British Bangalore, with its influences um, from the 1800s, right? Moving on to City 3, right? So when the British were busy building the contonment, what we saw come up on the other side was the Maharaja's Bangalore, right? You're seeing two places here, Maleshwaram here and Baswanguri, both that came up in the 1890s. In popular folklore, that's what we call as Malguri, um, Arkinarayan's mythical place. Um, but what you saw was the first instance of town planning. And all of this is where you find traditional Bangalore. What do I mean by traditional Bangalore? It's really a lot of temples. This is Bull Temple, 15th century. You'd see, uh, again, still strongly rooted in culture, right? Known for our uh, great dosas, that's from Vidyarthi Bhavan. Known for our filter coffee. Um, a test for a suit through South Indian is uh, how well you can make your press uh, coffee. So most South Indians you wouldn't start your day because a few cup of printer coffee. And all of this is what South Bangalore really um, portrays. And it really uh, um, starts from it really originates from this king, Krishnaja Wadiar. Um, late 1890s, early 1900s, did a lot for the city. Everything that you see there in terms of modernization was thanks to this uh, Maharaja, right? Um, also, early 1900s changed the face of Bangalore. Bangalore is the first city in the whole of Asia to get electricity. And if you ask why, and that's because gold was found in Kolar uh, in this period. And because they had to dig out the gold here, they got the general electric turbine all the way from London, sent it to... Uh, Shivana Samudra on elephant banks. And the first electric line went from Shivana Samudra all the way to Kolar gold mines. And the first city to be uh, electrified was Bangalore. So that's how you saw electri electricity in Bangalore. But something else that happened in this time, right? When these two great men met, when Sir M, uh, Sir, when Swami Vekananda was traveling to Chicago for his great speech at the World Religion Congress. It was the Maharaja of Mysore who had funded him. On his voyage to um, US, um, he met another Indian that was Jamshedji Tata, and he impressed upon him the importance of technical education um, and the benevolent Mysore Maharaja. Um, Jamshedji Tata, quite taken in by the idea, came back to India um, with the help of the Maharaja, set up what is called Tata Institute, or today the Indian Institute of Sciences, on 400 acres of land given free by the Maharaja of Mysore. So really what you're seeing is uh, the birth of the knowledge city, esteemed institutions like ISC later on, the Central College, institutions of excellence. What did that lead to was also a lot of industries. This is HAL, a Hindustan Aeronautical Lab, set up by the Walshan brothers in the 1940s, again, to supply aircrafts in the World War. But you're also seeing a whole wave of PSUs. This is HMT, Hindustan Machine Tools, the BEL, Bath Electronics. Bangalore really saw a great wave of these PSUs in uh, the 60s, 70s, and the 80s. 
um, including um, ISRO uh, for its space exploration, right? Um, this is a map of Bangalore, right? From 1940s until 2007, and how the industries have really propped up, right? So really you're seeing an outburst of, uh, of industries in Bangalore, right? Where, when you look at the world, we would call San Francisco and the Silicon Valley of the world, right? If you look at the Silicon Valley of India or, or Asia, it's really Bangalore. But do you think there's some parallels? Of course, there are parallels. What's the parallel? In the 1850s, it was the gold that really brought a lot of uh, enterprising gentlemen to San Francisco, the gold rush. It's the same story here. It was the gold in Kolar that brought in these people. Um, coupled with gold, um, it was the establishment of a lot of great institutions, Stanford, Berkeley, there in the Valley. And here it was, like I said, IIC Central College, the Massey University, one of the first in princely states. This whole um, mixture, entrepreneurial minded folks with, an, with great institutions of uh, excellence gave rise to what is called the knowledge economy. And that's how what you see Bangalore becoming the knowledge capital of uh, Asia and that is what I call City 4, right? City 4 is, I don't have to do much talking about City 4 because that's the identity of Bangalore today. City 4 is the tech city. Okay? This is a picture of Texas Instruments, the first MNC to set shop in India. This is in the 1980s. You'd see uh, the computers are being brought in by a bullock cart, right? Um, and in the 90s and early 2000s, what you're seeing is a wave of... Uh, IT services companies, uh, today multi-billion dollar companies, Wipro, Infosys, TCS, have the largest centers here in Bangalore. Um, and the first two are headquartered here in Bangalore, right? And riding on the IT way, what you saw post-2008, after the financial bubble burst, was really the startup, um, the startup ecosystem having flourished, right? These are all billion dollar enterprises, all come out of Bangalore, right? All come out of Bangalore. So today, that's what Bangalore is known for, the IT city or the startup capital. And it's not just Indian starting companies here. A few years ago, I met these gentlemen who have set up a chain called California Burritos, selling Mexican burritos here in Bangalore. When I asked these American gentlemen what made them come to Bangalore, and they said, the future is either in China or in India, and we can't speak Mandarin, so we decided to come to India. And I asked them, do Indians like uh, burritos? They say, of course, this is nothing but roti, rajma, and chawal, right? So what you're seeing today in Bangalore is an amalgamation of some of the finest minds, solving some of the most complex problems of our world. Um, with that, I'll come to towards the end of my talk. This for me is Bangalore, the city that I've spent most summers of my life. Very strongly rooted in our history and our culture. We are a crowd that uh, is equally comfortable with our dosas and our beer. And it's a city that's uh, solving for the future. Right? Nehru said India lives in its past, present and the future. And it's the truest in Bangalore. There is no other city in the world that lives in its past, present, and the future than how Bangalore does, right? So that for me is the Bangalore story. Thank you everybody for your patience and that's time. Thank you, Suki, and thank you. Thank you so much, Vinay. You've uh, very smoothly taken us through 400 years of uh, Bangalore and transitioned us through um, so much of so so different and uh, varied aspects of Bangalore. Thank you very much. Uh, like I was telling you, Bangalore has a special place in my heart and you've just made it a little bit more special for us today. Thank you. I'm going to ask people if they have questions. Of course, there are a lot of compliments for you in the um, in the chat. Amazing history, well condensed, um, says uh, Parmesh. Ranjana says it was an amazing talk. Dr. Manish Talim says thank you for a glimpse into Bangalore's uh, varied history. And Manish Mahesh says wonderful. Uh, so I, I see a lot of uh, compliments uh, coming your way. Folks, if you have any questions, please drop them. Vandana has a question. Can you suggest a book that comprehensively captures Bangalore history? Mm, that's a very interesting question, Vandana. 
Mm, there are a couple. Um, I really like Ask You by T.J.S. George. It's a very short, very small book, but beautifully talked over the city. But you also have others like um, Maya Jayapal, written a very interesting book on Bangalore. Paul Coloco, Paul Colaco, and uh, Peter Colaco and Paul Fernandez written about cantonment Bangalore. Um, so yeah, the artist. And, That's Paul. It's Paul Fernandez, the artist has exactly. So it's a it's, it's a it's a very interesting take on cantonment Bangalore. Um, Vijay Tirwadi written about Lal Bagh. So there are a bunch of different books. But, uh, I ask you is is a quick fast read, and I enjoy them. Uh, Manish, Dr. Manisha Talim wants to know what languages are spoken in Bangalore. Oh, that's a very good question. Of course, it's Canada here, and we're all Canada guys. But what you also see with the with the British presence in Bangalore, you have a you have an interesting mix of influx. Like Tamil is is a language that's spoken in Bangalore, especially in parts of Cantonment. If you look at the churches in Bangalore, Tamil is one of the languages in which. Uh, um, the sermon happens, right? So you have the, the Telugu speakers. So the British cantonment really was supported by a mix of Maratha, a mix of uh, uh, Telugu, a mix of uh, uh, Tamil speakers, because they won't trust the locals with their allegiance to the Maharaja. So you'd see um, Kannada being spoken, of course, English. You'd also see smattering of Tamil, uh, Telugu, and uh, parts of Marathi as well. Uh, Sneha would like to know if you can repeat the names of the four cities in short. Oh, yeah, for sure, Sneha. The oldest being Chikpet or Pete. That's the oldest part of Bangalore. Then came Cantonment, which was in around modern day MG Road, right? And um, then was what I call traditional Bangalore, the Basangudi and the Maleshwarams. And then came what is uh, IT Bangalore, that's the Whitefield. Uh, electronic city and today's startup Bangalore is Kormangla, HSR, Indranagar, right? So those are the four cities of Bangalore. Uh, Manisha probably missed the beginning of the talk, so she wants to know the basis of the name Bengaluru again, so maybe you'll enlighten her. Um, there's several claims, Manisha, one of them being the city of baked beans, but I, I doubt if there is an accurate history there. Uh, it's, they say it's named after the Benga tree. It's called Bengavaluru after um, the city of bodyguards. But my favorite story being the city of Big B. Right? So that's that's my favorite Bangalore origin story. Commander Mohan Narayan wants to know uh, whether the grant of land was uh, gratis was the chief factor of the setting up of the IIC in Bangalore. I think it's a very, very good question uh, um, there. If you see um, Ram Gwana's book, India After Gandhi says, most Maharajas in India were busy after wine, women or well, or off to Europe at a drop of hat, except for two, he says. One is the Maharaja of Baroda and the other is the Maharaja of Mysore. The Maharaja of Baroda funded Dr. Abhyar Ambedkar's education in London and here it was Swami Vivekananda. You really see the two great economic centers of India today is Bombay and Bangalore. Both of them most well the Baroda Kingdom, Mysore Kingdom. So I'm guessing there are a couple of factors. One, of course, the land being free. We are also under the tutelage of a great visionary Maharaja, right? Uh, who was very welcoming, you know, for new ideas. So I think it was land being free and it was also the attitude, which I think Bangalore very much still carries. Right? It's a very welcoming, very open-minded city and which is why these ideas flourish, right? So that's my take. Dr. Geeta wants to know if you're the grandson of Dr. Sesha Chalam, and if so, if you have a few lines of him. Am I the grandson? No, no, no. I, my grandfather was a freedom fighter, and another grandfather was an entrepreneur, but I don't think that is Dr. Sesha Chalam. Not at all. <laughs> so, uh, Nurul has a question. Why was Bangalore prioritized over Mysore? That's a good question, uh, Nurul. So if you really see with Sri Rangapatna, which was their capital and with the mosquito challenge there, when the residency moved to Bangalore and the Maharaja still lived in Mysore, right? And because really the British were calling shots, right? And that's when you saw Bangalore become more prominent, right? And uh, post-independence, they decided to keep Bangalore as its capital. So what you saw is really the wave of Bangalore, right? So the British really set the contournement and set the stage 
uh, going. And I think ever since there was no looking back. So Mysore remained the cultural capital, whereas Bangalore became the, the power engine of growth. Right? Commander Mohan Narayan wants to know if Kayoshi Gauri is still played at state functions. Yes, that's, 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 our, uh, uh, that's the song that's very much played in state functions. If I'm not wrong, the Maharaja of Mysore gave tune to it. Um, still very much, very much a popular uh, song. Yes, very much played during Dasra and state functions. Uh, PKS wants to know what was the role of Mirza Ismail in development of Bangalore over Mysore? Quite a bit PKS. I think uh, Bangalore, or the erstwhile Mysore kingdom, was also very fortunate to have some visionary divans. Just for the weekend, I was meeting the great-grand-nephew of uh, Saram Vishweshwaraya. Okay? So people like Saram Vishweshwaraya, uh, Sir Mirza Ismail, the people who had a grand vision. So really, um, the Maharaja, of, of course, was very supportive, but these divans really executed it. So Mirza Ismail's family, Ali Asghar is gra his grandfather, if I'm not wrong. Yeah, came from Persia. He was a horse trader. We still have an Ali Asghar road. So very much Bangalorean, but the divans were absolutely extraordinary. Extraordinary in terms of uh, how they ran the administration. Dr. Gita says it's because an artery, uh, an artery is named after him. The parallel artery where appendicitis is done. The only Indian doctor whose name is mentioned in medical books. Oh, very interesting. I'm not sure who's Dr. Gita mentioning. I'm not sure. Who is it, Dr. Gita? Who is an artery? artery? Oh, very interesting. I, I thought not. Who is it? Uh, Ronald Ross. Dr. Shesha, okay, very interesting. I didn't know that, Dr. Gita. Thank you very much. I learned something new. Okay. Uh, I know there are some queries about people who'd like to get a cop uh, recording of this session or any other that you might uh, miss out on Khaki. Uh, Khaki Lab is our YouTube uh, channel. Uh, please subscribe. And uh, this session, along with many others, uh, they keep getting uploaded through the week and you can uh, listen to our uh, prior speakers as well. Um, the first superintendent of Victoria Hospital, the doctor, Dr. Shesha. And uh, Vibha says that my great grandfather was the acting divan when Sir Mirza Ismail went traveling. Very interesting. Sneha would like if you have any um, interesting things about Algudi days relating to Bangalore, especially. Um, it's a very interesting question, Sneha. In fact, we run a tour in Mysore called Malgudi days. Arkinaran lived in Mysore. And um, a lot of the characters in his book are based out of Mysore. Um, I think it's an assumption that Malgudi is Malaysia and Baswangudi. In 2009, I had the good fortune of meeting Mr. R.K. Lakshman. And I asked him this question, is Malgudi named after Malaysia and Baswangudi? And he looked at me and said, you should have asked R.K. Narayan, right? So, uh, but a lot of them, right? Printer Margaya, Swami, all of them are real life characters, right? In fact, when Devan and the, uh, made the famous movie Guide. In fact, Guide was also a real life character in uh, um, based in Mysore. But the movie, the way it ended was very different from the way the, the book ended. And R.K. Narayan was very vocal about it and he very very famously called it the unguided guide because he was not happy with the movie at all. Right? So his connection of Bangalore, he, he, R.K. Narayan never lived here. We were all in Mysore. Mm -hmm. I'm guessing uh, might have visited and this is only an assumption that Malgudi is Malaysian. Basman That is that's really been a very very interesting uh, Q and A and the session. Uh, we thank you very much, uh, Vinay, for being with us this um, evening. And um, okay, I am going to take the next question from Sneha, who wants to know if there are any documentaries or movie recommendations about uh, other big cities in Karnataka, including Bangalore. That's a great question, Sneha. I don't think so, but I think that's a great opportunity to make one. Right? On that note, thank you very much, Rene. Thank you, everyone, for joining us on this Saturday evening. Do follow the channel so that you can get uh, some of our, uh, uh, any of the talks that you might have missed. Uh, we look forward to having you again, maybe another time with some more information. Uh, thank you very much. Have a good weekend. Thank you very much, Suki. We inflict ourselves in Bangalore and Mysore every weekend. Feel free to join us on our walks. We are gully.tours on Instagram and on Facebook. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.